Hello, nice to see you all and thank you for inviting me to give you a talk on my work. Um, so I'm Dr. Anke Brynje Richardson at the University of Huddersfield in the School of Applied Sciences. So I'm a senior lecturer in biomedicine, but I also do research in brain tumours. So the title of my talk is going to be Stopping Brain Tumours in Their Track. And I'd like to start this really with a slide. So if you look closely, there are probably quite a few people that you know or they're well-known faces. But what's not so well-known is actually that they have one thing in common. They all had a brain tumour. And this is the problem with this cancer we are facing at the moment. Um, it's not really exposed in the media. It's not really well known in the news, etc. Unfortunately, this is one of the worst cancers you can have. And I think it should be really sort of highlighted how, how poor funding is so far for these tumours and how little we know about these. However, things, times are changing. And I don't know whether you heard about that in the US, but here... Actually, the British government has now pledged much more money towards brain tumor research. And that's mainly because one actually of the ministers at the time, Tessa Jowell, had passed away because of a brain tumor. And before she passed away, she actually made this big pledge that she would like to um, get the government to, to support funding into this very important part of research. And I think a similar thing happened in the States with the passing of the then Vice President Biden's son. Uh, after that, the American government has pledged now this big program called Cancer Moonshot 2020. So there is a lot of money going into research and it's about time too. So what do we know about brain tumors? So there actually are over 100 different types. There's not just one type of brain tumor, but several hundreds that we are facing. And as you can see, there are at least about 5,000 cases per year in the UK. That might not sound so much to you, but if you look at the five-year survival, it is actually a very dire situation. So it's about 15%. If you look in comparison to other cancer types, it's a very dire situation we are finding ourselves in. Unfortunately, also, and even sadder, these cancers are now the biggest cancer killers of children, so overtaken leukemia. And also you find these cancers, particularly in the under 40s. So it's, it's actually a, a disease targeting the younger population. And even if you have treatment and you have um, survived your treatment and, and you are sort of going along as much as you can, you may have long-term neurological issues because of the, the tumor and because of the surgery that you have undergone. Clinically, they are very challenging, as you, as you probably expect, because of the location in the brain, and they are very poorly understood still in terms of biology and you know, the origins of these tumors. So we are really lagging behind in the research into these kind of tumors. And if you bear in mind as well um, that it's not only challenging for patients, um, but they are also challenging families, because again, due to tumors and due to uh, surgery, these patients can develop personality and logical changes. And that is obviously uh, difficult to explain to somebody who doesn't understand that this is a patient um, suffering from a brain tumor. So it's a big, big problem, a sad problem. So I work on the most aggressive form of, of brain tumors called glioblastoma or GBM. And as you can see here, it's a very aggressive primary tumor progresses rapidly and um, you can see on that MRI scan and uh, within 68 days the lesion has enlarged um, very visibly and rapidly and also these tumors are characterized by extensive invasion so they, they are very very motile and single cancer cells or groups of cancer cells can move migrate away quite quickly from the original tumor into in, in a new place or new site in the brain and start growing again. Um, tumors are also characterized by necrosis, that means they've got a dead sort of a center and that again gives off signals uh, to the other surrounding um, uh, cancer cells to so, migrate away from the original tumor and find a new site in the brain. And we also see vascularity. So these tumors are actually able to lay their own blood supply. So you see what we're fighting against is quite um, complex. So the, the ability to supply yourself with your own sort of nutrients that you need, your ability to migrate extensively, and the ability to give out warning signals to the other cancer cells in your environment to migrate away when conditions become adverse. Unfortunately, little therapeutic progress has been made in decades. 
unlike other cancer types, for example, breast cancer or prostate cancer, where we've seen huge advances in the treatment. So you can see here the normal treatment regime for, for um, brain tumor patients is a surgery, first of all, where, where they're trying to surgically resect the tumor and uh, remove as much as they can. But unfortunately, due to the location of these tumors, you cannot do that and you will leave some tumor tissue behind. And this is then followed by radiotherapy and chemotherapy. But even with the combined treatment of surgery, radio and chemotherapy, our median survival is about a year. This is a very dire situation, and unfortunately, with the high-grade tumors, they will recur. So once the patient has received the treatments, probably about a year's time or so, the tumor will be back. And the problem with this is then, um, there's nothing to be done apart from palliative care. So this metastatic, what, if you want to call it, process is very common for these high-grade tumors. And this is actually a cause of death in these patients. Now, you all know Hanahan and Weinberg in, in their work of uh, the hallmarks of cancer. They revisited this work in 2000 and they included activating invasions and metastasis as one hallmark of cancer. And to my mind, this is very important because if you can see that patients die because of metastasis or recurring tumors, surely to prevent death of the patients, um, would mean that maybe we should look into targeting um, this invasion and metastatic process rather than trying to kill off the, the cells themselves. Of course, we want to kill them off. But on top of that, why do we not try and prevent the invasion and migration of the remaining cells into healthy tissues in the brain uh, where they start to recede and re regrow? So I'm really, really interested in finding ways to target this migratory activity of these cells and to be able to stop migration invasion into new and healthy parts of the brain and potentially see this then as a combination treatment with conventional treatment. So the idea is that at surgery, at time of surgery, you remove as much of the tumor as you can. And then at that same time, you also add to your um, chemotherapy some kind of anti-migratory drug that will prevent the spread or the migration of the remaining cells. So we can actually maintain the disease at site. What kind of targets are they? Well, I started working with a very clever scientist called Sean Lawler, who um, was my PI at the time at Leeds, and he was very interested in an enzyme or kinase called SK3. Now, GSK3, glycogen synthase kinase 3, is a serine 3 in kinase. And we know a lot about it because it is involved in the hormonal control of glucose homeostasis. But it has been recently shown that a GSK3 is also a driver of vision and migration in various cancer types, including um, brain tumors. We also know that these are highly, or GSK3 is highly expressed in brain tumors. So it looks like it is a very, very good target um, to a more close investigation. But to do this, we also need to know how do cells actually move. And for people that are not so aware of this particular part of research and science, there are three components you really have to remember. So first of all, to generate motility, the cell utilizes the actin filament or the, the actin cytoskeleton. To give it traction, so to allow it to adhere or to attach and detach from the surrounding, it needs focal adhesions. And to have some kind of directionality, um, so actually going somewhere rather than just turning on the spot, we have the microtubule cytoskeleton. So you can see here a picture of a brain tumor cell, and very clearly they have a really pronounced front, cell front, and the back, the tail. And this front is very much enriched with the actin filament, as you can see, the green, the, high, the really highly bright green stain is, is indicative of this um, actin front that is very enriched with actin. And yet, therefore, we, we have a direction in these cells, and we also have the motility, and we have the attachment to the, the environment. And when I talk to my students about it, and it's, it's maybe a concept that's not so easy to understand, I will say, well, Think of a car. What does a car need to drive? It needs um, steering, it needs power, and it needs also the contact with its surroundings, so using tires to, to propel itself forward. And it's exactly the same with cancer cells, and especially with highly motile cells like um, glioma cells. So you can see here glioma cell that is um, labeled for the various components. 
And if we look again, we know there is some kind of tractions in these cells, they have power, and they also have some steering. And if you want to really put that into a cartoon type of way, we can see that the microtubules in red are the drivers of uh, orientation or the ability to orientate yourself. Um, we can see in the front of these cells that there's the actin that is very pronounced. And on the sides, we have focal adhesions that allow the attachment and detachment. What we also know is that cells like to follow neuronal tracks. Um, glymosers are very, very efficient of finding their way around in the brain. They follow neuronal tracks. And bear that in mind because that is also important for targeting uh, particular key players here. So GSK3. There was a very nice paper by Sonnetto um, which showed that GSK3 is actually involved in the regulation of all three key players in cell migration. So GSK3 phosphorylation targets the actin filament, it targets the focal adhesions, and it targets also microtubule cytoskeleton um, and, and their regulations. And in the group I worked previously in, in Leeds and I continued to work at at Huddersfield, we looked at all three components, not so much the focal adhesions. We started looking a little bit into it, but then sort of diverted away to the actin filament. And here you can see all the people that worked with me in the past and present on various aspects of these um, signaling pathways involving the actin filament or regulation of the actin filament and the microtubule cytoskeleton. So my hypothesis really was is that targeting glioma migration might prevent glioma cells from spreading into healthy parts of the brain and reseeding the original tumour. We were very lucky at Leeds that we had a fantastic setup uh, to the clinic there. So basically what happens in clinic is that the patients come in for, for surgery and then we send out a research nurse to inform them and ask them for, for their access to their tissue samples. So we consent the patient. And then once that happens, the, the research nurse will bring back the sample to the lab where there's lab technician and the lab technician then takes the sample and that we can then use for all our studies we do in the lab. So you see that's very, very important to have this kind of network and we really, really appreciate these interactions with the patients at a really the worst time that they can have. We approach them and ask them for their, their tissue and ask them for consent to use it. But so far we've not been turned away at all. So you can see how dire this whole situation is and we are very, very relying on these kind of samples. And so what we do then in lab is, first of all, we generate monolayers from these lines or from these cells and make them into cell lines. And here, as you can see, this is a standard way of growing cells in tissue culture. And what you see here is the image um, of one of the cell lines we use is called due to 5 one And they grow really well in, in culture. And what we can do then is uh, we can look at these by live cell imaging, just to say the way how they migrate. And I hope you can see here, on the left, we're just starting the film. This is all U251 cells migrating along the plastic. And as I just previously mentioned, you can see how, how well these cells migrate and they push out this very elaborate um, lipodia front and then the tail that is retracted. So it's really a push-pull um, sort of motion. But if we look at a certain GSK3 inhibitor, I hope you can see that over time, these cells actually slow down and they can move on the spot. And these cells are not dying because when you withdraw the drugs, they start to migrate again. So it is definitely um, a direct effect on, on their way or on their ability to migrate. So it's very fascinating to see, and also this particular shape that they become very rounded. And of course, we can then um, analyze them for various parameters. And you can see here, for example, that with two different uh, GSK3 inhibitors called lithium chloride and bioindoribin, um, we see a reduction in, in the speed or velocity of these cells, which is great. Now, this is very good, and you can actually do quite a lot of um, assays and experiments on this type of um, cell line and this type of environment, but it's not very representative of the original tumor. So what we now created or have created recently is a tumor spheroid. And this is easy to do with a particular plastic you can buy. It's a 96 volt plate, it's a non-adherent um, culture plate. So the cells, they cannot attach to the bottom and are forced to form spheroids or tumor balls. And these are really 
quite representative of the original tumor when we did some analysis on him structurally by IHC, et cetera, we could see, yes, it actually tumors structurally and anatomically. And when we then take these little mini tumors or spheroids and implant them into collagen, then we kind of give it the environment or an environment to migrate into. So the collagen matrix we're using really mimics the surroundings in the brain. And we can then form migration over time in the setup. And as you can see here by the immunofrescent staining, the green is actin stain and every little appendage uh, getting away from the original spheroid is a migrating cell. And just to show on the right hand side, the duppy stain is just to confirm that the cells are alive and, and, and migrating and are, are structurally sound. So then again, we can do assays on these, and here you can see that we're just adding um, drugs, lithium chloride and bioengeribin, and I hope you can see over time at 70 chows, is this, when this um, time point was taken, the um, migration away from the original spheroids is greatly reduced. So these appendages are sort of greatly reduced, they are shorter, um, they are not as many in number, and again, we can put some figures on that it worked really well, this kind of assay, so we can actually test or screen a lot of compounds of interest. If you then film these spheroids over time, again, by live cell imaging, what is interesting is that firstly here in the untreated spheroid, the cells more or less straight away start to migrate. You can see how efficiently they're doing this. And then they're getting away from the original tumor or tumor ball, tumor spheroid. And really the spheroid is sort of getting destroyed in the process because the cells are migrating away. However, when you treat with your inhibitor, the cells do migrate, some of them at least do, but the majority seems to stay or maintain or be maintained within the original spheroid. And they also round up much more. Again, the phenotype I see in 2D, I also see in 3D, which is obviously, again, an indicator of the activity of SA3 and in, in regards or in terms of, of cell morphology and cell migration. We can also do another assay, and this is a nanofiber assay where we have plates with nanofibers aligned in a certain direction, and as I mentioned earlier, so cells can actually migrate along these um, nanofibers, and that's what they look like in high resolution. And if we plant our spheroids again onto these nanofibers, I hope you can see at 72 hours with a green fluorescent stain highlighting this, how well these cells migrate away from the original tumor sphere or spheroid. And, and every single little green dot is a cell migrating away. And then when we add our drugs, we can see that uh, migration is inhibited. So we have a smaller image on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we can see um, circled the control, how far these cells have spread away, migrated away from the original spheroids. But then in response to the GSK3 inhibitor, we can see that it is greatly reduced. So we've got these assays that we can use quite, quite effectively to look at different ways and to mimic um, the way these cells migrate in a 3D environment. Now, finally, um, you would say, well, what is happening structurally or um, at subcellular um, levels? And here we started looking more closely at the actin, the microtubules, and, and the focal adhesion in these cells. And just by immunofluorescence studies, and as you all know, we can either use fluorescent dyes to do it, or we can have some particular antibodies. And if you just look at the microtubules, for example, it's very interesting. We have this very delicate network of microtubules, which seems to completely disappear when you treat with the inhibitor. And also with the actin, we have a very pronounced red labeling on the surface or the, just the cellular front of the cell, where it's, it's relocated, distributed all over the cell with stress fibers appearing as well. We see a lot of focal adhesions all over the cell, which are relocated to the, the cell surface. So there's obviously something going on that affects focal adhesion dynamics and also the, the actin for localization and microtubules, for potentially a collapse of the microtubules. So that is all targeting GSK3. And if you then put figures again on these, you can see that, um, as we've seen before, the, the speed is definitely affected, the, the treatment and the morphology changes completely, and actins and focal and actins are, again, uh, redistributed or um, 
definitely um, um, the dynamics of these are affected. We also did some analysis with microarray um, where we treated our cells U251 with the inhibitor and then obviously sent off, we extracted the RNA and sent it off for, for gene um, analysis and we, we looked at gene expression here and you can see that in response to the inhibitor we found several genes, quite a few that were down or upregulated in response to treatment. And when you look more closely, we actually find genes with known roles associated with um, cell migration. For example, there because of their location in the plasma membrane or the cell periphery or the extracellular matrix. So that was very interesting itself. And from this whole list, I actually identified a group of, of genes that seem to be directly involved in regulating the actin. And what I can say is that um, I took two genes or with their protein products with opposite predicted um, anti-migratory or pro-migratory activity. And I did some stable knockdowns in my cell line and I could definitely see an effect on migration, either it being more proactive or um, anti-migratory. And I also did some in vivo studies and I could mimic by intracranial injection of these cells and, and looking at the tumors that develop that the morphology in the knockdowns changes according to what the knockdown was. So we can see that there is really um, um, a big arc um, starting off with GSK3 um, signaling that affects gene transcription and translation which has a knock-on effect and downstream in fact on the actin filament and actin polymerization. So this is obviously something that I'm really interested in and I'm following up now um, to confirm you know what exactly is going on with these genes and can we actually look at them as potential targets for anti-migratory drugs or for the development of anti-migratory drugs. So really to summarize, I hope that you can show you that inhibition of, of um, GSK3 in my case leads to cytoskeletal rearrangements and changes in focal adhesion dynamics in cell lines. And these inhibition leads to loss of direction and the ability to migrate in 2D and in 3D. And I have my identified members of the actin polymerization pathways which are involved in such processes. And Targeting cancer cell migration, to my mind, may be an alternative treatment regime to prevent tumors from spreading in the brain. And this wouldn't be seen as a replacement. Obviously, this would be seen as, as a compl complementary sort of treatment in addition to such toxic drugs. And I hope that this is the way this research is going in the next few years. And I'd like to thank all my group, past and present, and thank you for listening.